box seat final show of the season brought to you in association with Woodlands of course they stand Sweet Lou, they stand Better's Delight and a whole lot of others uh, Michael Guerin, the IRT Harness Jewels 2019 could have been a total disaster but a whole lot of people got together, the crew at Addington our own crew on trackside, a whole lot of other people to make it happen and it ended up being one heck of an occasion It did Greg, a big hi to everybody, hope your week's been good, hope your Jewels hangover has dissipated. I thought it was a great day's racing and, and once you go through the results and the races you're about to see again, there's not many horses you look at and go, well the wet track really affected its chances. Sure it was hard for horses coming wide on the track but almost all premier harness racing meetings that tends to be the case. I thought we ended up with the right horses winning the jewels with a combination of manners or ability and Greg there's a lot of horses now which are looking for the spelling paddock and probably a few more than I thought. I think some of the travel plans we thought might be coming post jewels, uh, there'll be no boarding cards for them. Yeah, looking forward to hearing all of that news. So why don't we go to one of the features of the day. It was, of course, uh, the four-year-old Trotters. That means it was a ruby. This one was with Macmillan Equine Feeds. We'll take in the entire race for each and every jewel today and talk over the top. What most expected to happen, very similar to the trial the week before, Michael, was this multiple Group 1 winner now, Sunday Sun, working his way to the lead. And once he got there it was always going to be very hard for him to get beaten. Well, there's the crucial part of the race just there. He's trotting off the gate. He's no longer in the half hopples. He's a comfortable looking horse. There's no hitch. There's no head going up and down and he leads. And once he led, this race was over as long, Greg, as he performed to the same level as Alexandra Park, the Anzac Cup and the Road Cup. Winterfell was going to sit outside and there was going to be no challenges because two of the big guns are at the front end of the field. This is a perfect example of a crop that has changed places. This time last year, Winterfell was significantly the best horse of this bunch. Now, Sunday Sun is significantly better. And often we find with the trotters, once they get in the zone, and John Dunn and Robert continue to tell us that this horse had thrived since uh, winning the dual group ones at the Row Cup Carnival and in on the markers here. Oh, look, I thought Winterfell was outstanding. He had to work around a sit park. It hasn't been perhaps the season his connections would have liked, but he was absolutely brave in this. King's Landing had disappointed throughout the season. One of the more phenomenal runs of the day came from Majestic Hurricane, who in the score up we had the massive issue once again, and we had a few uh, false starts unfortunately on the day. Hardly surprising given A, the weather, and B, uh, the windy nature uh, where they hit the wind into the back straight because the southerly was so strong. There's Majestic Man trying to come wide. Uh, it was never going to be easy for him. Uh, Majestic Player tried to follow that runner. Of course, uh, Tony Hula, he took that spot with forget the price tag, but with this horse rolling, the sectionals in front like he was, uh, he got home in 57.5. They were never going to get close. When the best horse in the race leads, they often win, and that's the case here. This race was over a lap ago. Winterfell was good. I still sort don't of think he's improved as much as I would like to see between three and four, and that's a concern for four and five. Maybe he'll have that sort of back end of the season next year where he'll get stronger, but I don't know. The jury's still out on him. The rest of the majestic man looked like he was tired enough. He's had enough of the season, and King's Landing clearly needs to have a break, so... This horse heading forward at the right time. He was the most impressive, most definitive and best winner of the day. So well done to Robert and John Dunn to the connections, the hears. Um, this horse is now almost certain, Greg, to win Trotter of the Year. And of course joins Bombay as an Anzac Cup, Row Cup and Jules winner. I think they're the only two that have completed that treble. Well, and done in a vastly different way because he's had to overcome himself. Monbay was such a professional and he was always going to be a great horse once you know, we saw that early season form from him. Sunday Sun, totally different horse. Cup time, I remember sitting next to you and Craig and thinking, look at this rat galloping away. And, you know, he, he, he didn't engender you with any confidence. But nope, he's a different horse now. He'll be trotter of the year. And bizarrely, if you'd told people six weeks ago the favourite for the Inter Dominion series would be Sunday Sun, they would have laughed at you. But now it's impossible to go past him. 
Robert Dunn, only two harness duels. Shows you how hard they are to win. Franco Nelson, when Dexter did the steering on that occasion, and now this horse. Uh, and not really renowned for the trotters over the years, uh, RJ, but he's got himself a very good one here. He's got himself a good bunch too, Greg. They've got some nice trotters right throughout the level. In fact, Valoria was in this race, and he, like a lot of people, realising that it's awfully hard to beat the All-Stars in the pacing game. He has more luck than most at that, but in the trotting game, as we saw on Saturday, the All-Stars won none of them. Um, it's basically a case where, you know, there's RJ giving a hug to Colin here. Um, you can beat them. We saw that. And this horse now has an enormous array of things in front of him because he's quite a small narrow type of horse. I would suggest there's a few kilos to go on the frame. He has a lot in front of him. Will he live up to that next year? I have absolutely no idea, but it's an interesting bunch of four-year-olds because I think they've got the wood on most of the older horses in this division. Matthew Cross had a massive day for us on Saturday and well done to him in the elements. I uh, thought he conducted himself very professionally and he has got all of those just in behind each of our feature winners. Mark Winterfell, talk me through what you thought. Oh, I thought it was a great run. He, um, he drew out wide and just crossed outside of Sunday Sun, so the front was never there, and he raced a little bit keen outside him, so I was, quite, I was really proud that he, he stuck to his task right to the end. Well, Ken, for as many headaches as he's provided you, he ran well today. He did, yeah. I couldn't hold him early, and the false start stirred him up, but he just does things that he doesn't shouldn't do. Like he, As soon as he got in the trail, he dropped the bit and ran on good like we know he can. End of a pretty good season for Majestic Man. That's the, right, that's the case. I think Maddie's just uh, probably come to the end of a hard season for him. You know, um, some great runs up north and he stepped up, uh, op, up to open company, but he's probably just maybe feeling the effects for a long season. He, he didn't race like himself. So good to get the insight there. I did speak to Phil Williamson as well. He said both of his trotters underperformed, um, he believes. So therefore, they're in need of a break. And yeah, I, I'm with uh, Brad. He's done a great job, uh, Majestic Man, and he'll be a force in any open class race he lines up in the new season. Yeah, he will. Um, these four-year-olds, I think, will take over from the older horses, but it's not as easy as that. A lot of open class racing here next year, the normal races plus the Inter-Dominion, it's going to be hard for one horse to dominate. We might see different horses throughout the season as the best trotter in the country. But at the moment, that's Sunday Sun. That is the first of nine Group 1s we are going to review for you. We'll stick with the trotters. Let's go to the three-year-old Ruby. was always going to be an exciting race, particularly for you and your family, Michael, with Kratos, and he yeah, didn't yeah. let you down. But here's the all-important start, and the Aussie made a very good beginning, but things changed a little bit. Cheerful galloping, unfortunately, for overzealous. One of two uh, checks, the grey copped, and uh, that was the end of its chances. And more significantly, Michael, the galloping enhanced your calm. Well, it was always a chance, and Hans, your calm is the best of this crop, but clearly there's a few little issues there somewhere. There's all cashed up having a gallop, as he did two starts earlier at Melton, early in a race. So that wasn't a total surprise to see that. Once the gallopers had shaken themselves out, we ended up with Tickle Me Pink in front of him. And what a story it is um, to come back from nine months in the wilderness. Tricky Rick, who initially they indicated they might look to settle off the gate, actually charged off the gate and got that trail and Kratos was three back on the inside. Here's the crucial part of the race. Tony Hooley, he wants to stay in front with Tickle Me Peak and therefore Get Lucky has no chance of getting round to the lead, Greg, and that pretty much ended his chances and of course Enhance Your Calm out the back was, well, never a winning factor. The other interesting horse is four deep on the inside, the leader in the Jules division, a lot of muscle. The way he hits the line here, we'll see this in about a minute's time. I think he's a horse who's had enough. I think half the horses who lined up on Saturday had had enough for the season, and I think he's an indication of one who had. Tony Hooler, he uh, racks up win number 20 in the training ramps in terms of his Group 1s. and. It's just been an incredible ride since 2002 when effectively he started training because prior to that he'd only won 11 races. Since then, Michael, as a trainer, he's trained 920 winners. And we always think about him being such a great driver that we don't think about his training skills as being at the same level. He won two races the other day. Um, this is a magnificent training performance. So he's in front, coming wide to enhance your calm, but things are about to go awry there. 
and then we have this controversial stage in the last 100 metres where there's a touch of the sulky stays. I was in the inquiry room, the right decision was made. Here's Mark McNamara and the three-year-old Ruby. Takes the lane from Gil Faber. The leader is still Tickle Me Pig. Tricky Rick's half a length away. The leader Tickle Me Pig. Tricky Rick a neck away from Gil Faber. Tickle Me Pink ahead. Tricky Rick still Tickle Me Pink. Yep, Tickle Me Pink. Tickle me pink beak, tricky Rick and Gil Favour. Fourth crowd toss, then came enhanced your... So a very professional performance from a Tickle Me Pick, of course, raced by the Brecon Farms, the Perfect Ten Syndicate. And they were delighted. And there's Ken. He's always great after the race, isn't he? Uh, wrapped as much for their involvement of their breeding side of things, but the syndicate around them, uh, a big, big thrill for them. Yeah, what they're doing for harness racing, among other people who breed and syndicate horses, is huge. Now, I thought they would look, because he's had a very short season, only six weeks of bracing, to head to maybe the Victorian Trotting Derby uh, and the Breeders' Crown Phillies Division. Tony Hurley, he's very lukewarm on that, and he said Ken and Karen have been great about not forcing his hand. I think she'll head to the paddock. And if she does go to the paddock, I think she'll be joined by a couple of others. Enhance your calms. Clearly had enough. There's a few issues with the big frame there. And Oscar Bonavina, who won at Ashburton on Sunday. Now, because he's had a truncated season, I would have thought he also could be a horse who would head to Australia. I spoke to Mark Purden last night. That won't be happening. Oscar is going to also head to the paddock for a very interesting reason. Mark said, I think he's good enough to race an open class next season. So we might head to the Inter Dominions. He needs a break now. So the Australians, who could have been thinking their trotting derby would have three genuine big names in it from New Zealand, won't have to worry about them. Pretty sure that Ken and Karen Brecken bought Luby Ann from America, bought her out here. She's left Luby Lou, a derby winner, beat Winterfell, Majestic Man, amongst others, in that. And now this girl, what, what an inspired decision that was. And we're seeing once again that these trotting families just reproduce and reproduce. Occasionally get pacing winners out of left field. They come from families you're not expecting them to come from. But with these trotting families, the real, the, the big blue blood families keep producing them. So, look, Brick and Farms have put a lot of money into Trotters Greek. And they started putting money into Trotters a decade ago with I Can Do's It and the like, when they weren't fashionable and they were giving them away at the sales, that market has changed considerably. And I, I think she's a good open class horse. I think she'll race on if she stays sound. And she's worth uh, a fortune, Mike. Well, well she yeah. is. And, and she'll race on. And Greg, she's got gate speed. And over half of our major trots now are from the mobile. So she has a lot of options going forward. I think the, the idea not to go to Australia is the right one because she's done such a great job. You don't want to sour her. Uh, at the back end of, of, of a fantastic season. OK, let's hear from, starting with Josh Dickey, of course, uh, who got very close to winning it with Tricky Rick, and those others just in behind. Tricky Rick, talk me through that. Yeah, great run, Matt. Um, we had some hiccups at home, those Northern Derby and size stakes, and, yeah, it was good to see him back up, um, you know, after all that, and he went a great race. He went down gallantly. Kratos ran well also between those two trotters. What are your plans? Um, Tricky Rick's going to the paddock, um, he's going to have a good couple of months off. Um, Kratos is actually going to Melbourne, um, yeah, Mick's quite keen to take him to the trotting derby and, and hopefully race and sell him over there, so um, yeah that's his plans. Well Gil Favour, a good effort? Yeah, no, another good effort, he's a good honest little fella, so he's done a good job this year. Okay, talk me through the run you got out there. I just got a nice nice run through and ended up quite a nice position in the 1-1 one -one and um, he just just got out, got out on the bend there nicely when they that get lucky he was getting a wee bit tired and, and um, you know run home quite well. Okay, what were the reports from Bob on Lot of Muscle? Uh, he's just not didn't feel as sharp as he can do. Um, you know he's he's not as a, a very robust type of horse and um, I think a, you know good spell would be well earned for him. Yeah. Okay, is that the case for Gil Favor as well? I think so. Yes. Yes. Zach, talk me through the run of Kratos. Uh, I spoke to Mick before the race and he gave me a few driving instructions, so I did the opposite to what he said and uh, everything worked out tippity-boo. So, hey, he went super, he ended up with a good run 3 deep. He probably just got a little bit lost turning for home. I thought maybe he could have run third, but just got left a little bit flat-footed and, and he dug in late and actually finished the race off really well. So, you know, he's a nice horse. He's probably not right up there with the top three, but he's going to do a good job in that grade. Mark and Hans, you come. Uh, what did you make of him out there today? No, I'm not sure what to make of him. He, he trots perfect after he made that mistake, and uh, I don't know why he should have made it, but 
you know, his effort was good after that, but you can't afford to give away that ground. What do you do with him now, Mark? Uh, he'll go out to the spelling paddock now. Yeah, that's uh, evident for quite a few of the runners from yeah. uh, Saturday, what isn't it? Uh, yeah, there are. And uh, they're going such quick speeds these days. Now, both the Dicky pair, Tricky Rick is actually likely to go to Melbourne with Kratos. And because so many of the others aren't going, I think they can go Victoria Derby August 4th into the Breeders' Crown, which is separated boys and girls. Alpha Male, the best three-year-old over there, hasn't been seen for a while. So they might be two of only a handful of horses heading to the carnival over there. And that's probably, Greg, because... Oscar Bonavino and Hart, your Carmen Tickle, we peak, are going to be open class horses. They, they, are, they need a break now. I don't think Tricky Rick and Kratos will be open class horses here. They would get there, but they wouldn't be competitive. Whereas in Australia, they'd do a good job. So I think it's the place for them to go. What John chooses to do with Tricky Rick, I'm not sure. Eventually, with Kratos, we may well leave him over there. And Zach was right. I wanted to get to the marker peaks. He got to the marker peaks, drove the horse perfectly, just wasn't good enough. Yeah, well, he still went a great race and a, a massive thrill for Look, the family. It, it, was, it, was, it was, I'll be honest, Greg, I, I, I didn't even pay attention to him. Yeah. Um, I was just more interested in... in in the day, and we had a good day on camera, and that's, that's, that matters far more to me than a horse. Sticking with the Rubies, we're going to roll into the two-year-old, which, again, we had a couple of false starts early on. This was uh, one of those, and when they're running into that wind, the two-year-old trotters, as I mentioned before, was never going to be uh, a pleasant experience for many of them, hence the reason there were a few problems. One that got off the gate beautifully was Cracker Hill, and... Indicative of, we just saw it from Tony Herlihy, more evident here with Brad Williamson. I describe it as the aerial up. When they hold the stick up and say, fellas, you can come and have a look all you like, but there won't be any lead there for you. And that includes family members. So when Nathan Williamson comes forward with Dad's horse, I was sitting there thinking, right, he'll probably take a trail here. But see the aerial <laughs> being uh, up in the air there? There was no lead at all. There's a few gallopers. There's unfortunately Muscle Mountain, clearly another horse that had come to the end of it, uh, having a gallop around that bend. But at this point, and then Tailored Elegance uh, galloped, leaving effectively only four in the race. Well, with this crop, Greg, most of the horses we've spoken about who have already galloped in this race have galloped at some stage in other races. Now, Tailored Elegance wasn't a horse we expected it from, but back on the inside, early in the day, you're getting a lot of backwash, a lot of stuff in the face, which the horses this age aren't used to. So there's only four winning chances here, and Tony Hula, he's just sitting there on bolt for brilliance, minding his own business. They are going for it in front. The two horses in front probably going quick enough that they give them his chance. But he's still a pretty talented horse. I don't think he's a natural two-year-old. I don't think anybody thinks he is. But he's come out here and won like a good horse. He's heading to the paddock on the back end of this. Um, the lead is a very game little horse, and I'm, I'm happy to see Brad get the good horse all young trainers need. And the horse outside the leader, again, I don't think a natural two-year-old, he was outstanding, and he has the makings of potentially our best three-year-old. I want to ask you about the influence of Muscle Hill as well. He had half the field, Michael, and they finished in places one, two, four, and five. When you speak to the trainers in Scandinavia and North America, they love the Muscle Hills because obviously they're talented, but they've got very good heads on them. They're smart horses, and you're seeing that here. So he's probably going to be our next great trotting stallion. Um, obviously Majestic Sun's doing a super job, but the Muscle Hills, now the numbers are getting bigger, are going to start having more victories like this. Here's Mark McNamara as Tony Hulahi gets the first of two Group 1s for the day. Bolt for Brilliance comes at them now. Cracker Hill leads. Bolt for Brilliance going to the Bolt for the Jewels. And yes, Bolt for Brilliance has nailed Cracker Hill. Ultimate stride ran third. Really interesting breeding around this horse, obviously by Muscle Hill, but out of too much to do, who Mike Austin developed and uh, won about 11 races, including an Inter-Dominion Heat mm. victory over Lyle Creek and something about Māori. The horse was bred by Brad Reed, who is the guy who runs, the chief executive of the Breeders' Association, and they named the horse, and we're not going to show you any vision of this because <laughs> it's not good, um, Brad once went to the cricket and was a streaker, and the boys, his mates, called it the bolt for brilliance. Uh, he did send us a photograph, but we're not going to show you that. <laughs> but anyway, so, so Brad was thrilled. He was over the moon to breed a horse. And when you're this heavily involved with the breeders, breeding is as good as owning them. So well done to all the connections. I think Tony paid about 30000 for this one. And yeah, Greg, there's a lot of very good three-year-olds in this crop, but... 
more than any other race of the day, there were a lot of horses here who would have loved to have been rugged up in the paddock a month earlier. 31 odd dollars as you see on your screen there, the upset of the day. Not the first time Tony Hurler, he has trained two Group 1 winners on the same programme. Fergie Mack, when it dead heated with Gotta Go Cullen, and the size, and Western Dream in the Oaks. Well there you go, I asked him the other day, and he said it's the first time he did it. So. Nope. Maybe it's the. I looked uh, up the record books. I, I suppose technically it's 1.5. But <laughs> yeah, I suppose. Tony so, didn't yeah. remember, and to be perfectly honest, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> um, look, with this crop heading forward, a lot of good three-year-olds in this bunch. I don't think any of them are going to head on to the Breeders' Crown. So I haven't spoken to Robert and John Dunn about their plans, but I think some trainers watching this might get this information and go, okay, if Mark Purden's not going to head to some of these races, maybe we might go. And that's not a bad way to go either, because there's a lot of money over the winter if your horse is handling the racing. Michael, domestically, the leader all-time Group 1 winning drives? Domestically? Winning drives. I'm going to tell you, because oh, I've obviously done this, Dan. I would have thought Tony or Mark. 71 wins. Maybe, maybe Mark might be ahead of them, but I did look up Ricky Mays. He's on 71, Tony Hurley here on 69. Of course, Ricky May will be next to 3,000. Yeah. I must have a look for Mark Persons, because his wins. will be right up there. A lot of wins for Ricky. That's, that's fantastic. I, I would have thought Mark might hold that, to be honest, because of the dominance over the last five years. But Natalie, Blair and, and Tim have driven some of those as well. So they obviously they separate their drives out of time. Well, he's got 27 jewels for a start, so yeah. he's a long way towards that, isn't I thought, he? I thought the trotters were really good on the day, because even though there were some gallopers, it's a point of difference from what we're going to see in the next part of the show with the pacing horses, Greg. And that's really important. So... Look, there's, there's a market there, there's a market for resales, they're, they're not tremendously expensive horses. Anybody who says you can't compete with the top stables, I think those trotting races showed that for not great money, there is definitely a, a doorway there. Yep, Bolt for Brilliance was very good, ironically driven by Phil Williamson at its first start. Let's hear from some other Williamsons. What's your summation of that, Brad? Uh, yeah, but we were gutting with the result, obviously, Matt, but, um, you know, over the moon with the horse and the way he's performed, so pretty proud of the horse. Just a shame that, uh, you know, Tony had the nice run and uh, done what Tony does best. It's pretty good, but your horse has also got a lot ahead of him, hasn't he? That's right, yeah, he's a great big horse, Matt. I've always sort of said to the owners he's not probably a natural two-year-old. Whatever we got this year was a bonus. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping he's going to come back big and strong and have a great three-year-old season. Having to sit park made it hard, but he's been pretty brave. Yeah, no, he had to sort of do that. I sort of, um, he sort of, yeah, he just probably wasn't trotting the best today and the conditions and that. And he, um, yeah, he just sort of, yeah, it was a pretty one pace sort of effort from him. But um, in saying that, we had a crack and he got around and he got a bit of prize money, so it wasn't all bad. From what you've felt, are you excited going forward to I, a three year old? I think he's a great star going forward. I think he'll be a lovely horse next year. And I think he's sort of, um, what he's done now has just been a raw talent and he'll be a bit of horse next year. Capped off a pretty consistent season, Robbie. She has indeed, yeah. Matt, the real piece of this. She's just a model of consistency and she's just trotted off the gate every start, put herself in the race and, um, yeah, she's on, just hasn't quite capitalised through the season on uh, occasions. But, yeah, she'll be a nice three-year-old. OK, any immediate plans for her? Um, no, she's going to the paddock now, yeah. She's, uh, she's done, her, done her dash. <laughs> Well, that's the rubies wrapped up on Harness Jewels Day with IRT 2019. We're about to take a short break. When we come back, we've got half a dozen Group 1s for the Pacers. Into your box seat for most of the most anticipated race of the day head to head clash wise was the Commodore Hotel Diamond. Of course, it did feature Bella Montana who led the head to head battles 3 1 with Princess Tiffany. And 
Well, here's Zachary Butcher getting off the gate very, very nicely. Princess Tiffany not so fast out. and Actually, at one stage was five wide, Michael, then four wide, and did a fair amount of work early doors to get around uh, to the park position and eventually into the front. And whilst there was only a pixel between them at the end, there she is four wide there. Um, it had to have played a part. Yeah, it did. I, th I think... She was just beaten by a faster horse. I think everybody pretty much <coughs> realises where they sit, Greg. Princess Tiffany might be the superior stayer, and Bella Montana is faster. So he, uh, she is the heir to Princess Tiffany's tortoise. So here she is working forward, and she gets the lead as we thought she would. It was a very brave decision by Zach, not surprising at all, but brave to still hand up, because if you get beaten by handing up at the 1100, people just abuse you. And how many times have we talked about it on the show? If you let the All-Stars get in front of you, very rarely do you get past. Yeah, he's done this quite a bit over the last five years. <coughs> Excuse me, over the last five years, and he's usually got it right. So once they got into this situation, it was going to be a drag race up the straight. This also, this little part here, didn't aid Princess Tiffany. A little bit of pressure from the outside, but I don't think it mattered too much. The bottom line is, Bella Montana's quicker, Princess Tiffany was there to be beaten, and Zach gets it inch perfect right. Interestingly, with both these horses, I thought one or the other would head to the breeder's crown. Uh, Bella Montana had a good talk to Barry Purden on Sunday. He's reluctant. He thinks she'll make a genuine open class horse. And for that reason, the paddock will beckon for her. That could change this week, but more than likely, she won't be heading to Australia. As you can see, have time is three wide. Kayla Marie's had quite a difficult run, and by this stage of the day, horses coming wide were in all sorts of pain. And Tony Hurley, who had a big day, is three back on the inside with Dinah Bolt, and she gets her Group 1 place. One favourite in front, the other stalking her. Let's see who takes out the three-year-old diamond. Princess Tiffany, the leader. She's holding. Bella Montana goes to the inside now. Princess Tiffany leading. Margin and Eck. Bella Montana driving. They come to the post, a pair of them. Princess Tiffany, a nose for mine. Princess Tiffany over Bella Montana, a nose. But don't give up if you're on the inside, Philly. Dina Brown... So that's the race I wanted to see. I wanted to see that eventuate, and that's exactly what happened. And uh, when Mark Mack thought the outside had won, we were both looking and thinking, and Wale was with us, oh, I'm not sure. And then eventually the result came through, and it was a massive result for the bookies as well, just quietly, because a lot of money invested on Princess Tiffany. Yeah, a lot of the multis would have gone right through all six All-Stars runners. In your mind, it's easy to think these horses, there's nothing between them, and that finish would suggest so, but... The bottom line is Bella Montana's 4-1 over Princess Tiffany. So she is superior on the record book. Here's that finish. And look, there's Princess Tiffany. And Bella Montana just pulls off her back. And we're getting a real point of view shot here. Um, gee, it was close. But she's quicker. Simple as that. And Princess Tiffany had her chance. So regardless of how hard she had to work, she still had her chance. And the other horse had to make up one and three quarter lengths inside the space of 200 metres. So Bella Montano I think goes to the paddock and will win filly of the year. Outstanding season, beautifully trained by Barry, wonderfully driven by Zach. Nothing more to say about her. Uh, Princess Tiffany, she heads to Matamata to the vet clinic for scintigraphy. Now, she is the most likely of the All-Stars runners to head across to Australia for the Queensland Derby, uh, sorry, Oaks, potentially the Derby, and then into the Breeders' Crown. But if that scintigraphy shows any issues, that plug will be pulled. I wouldn't be stunned if she doesn't go. So possibly Queensland, possibly Breeders' Crown, but she could just as easily stay at home. And Greg, these two horses would arrive in the four-year-old slash open-class mares scene and scare the hell out of the other mares because they're so good. Yeah, they would. Uh, this year, no Breeders' Crown heats here. They're all in Australia, so yep. that's, a, that's a difference as well, but uh, it's still run at the end of August. So even if she won Queensland and, and then won the Breeders' Crown, she can't take that title off Bella Montana because... Uh, well, she doesn't deserve to. I mean, and uh, not, not on the record. As good as she is, and I don't, I don't think there's anything between them. It's 4-1. Bella Montana has consistently beaten her. So even forgetting the fact that that was pre-Christmas for two of them, when Princess Tiffany was below her best, she's beaten her two out of three on Princess Tiffany's home track.
So she's been away from home. So wonderfully trained by Barry. Zach's driven her a treat. She's just awfully, awfully fast. How that transfers to being an open class horse, against the mares, it'll be fine. How it transfers to being an open class horse where staying is so important at those two mile levels. We I, haven't I, seen it for a wee while, I have guess we? we'll know in the future. It's yep. an incredibly hard thing for the mares to do. Look, Adore Me was a fantastic staying filly, and she managed to win a New Zealand Cup, but our open class system is not set up greatly for speed horses. It's set up more for stoves. OK, let's hear about uh, the place getters, or from the place getters, starting with Natalie Rasmussen. Very, very brave, isn't she? Oh, she went a great race again, just beaten by a better filly on the day. Um, she did a bit of work early, but no, she had a chance. The other one was just better. Plans with her now, Natalie? Uh, we'll just, just have a rethink now, um, catch up with Braden and Carolyn tomorrow and just work it out from there. Tony, she's kept off a consistent season. Yeah, no, she's actually gone terrific today, you know, a lot better than, you know, I thought if she runs in six or runs six, she'll, she'll have gone a really good race. But, um, yeah, no, she's, she's raced good and it's a bit of best run since she's been down here sort of thing. So, um, yeah, thanks to Jim and Sandy and yeah. Chanel for looking after and, yeah, no, they've done a great job, the crew, yeah, it's been great. Plans with her now, Tony? Uh, she'll spell now and, yeah, come back as a four-year-old mare for a while there and see how we go. Blair Kendra, what did you make of that? Yeah, look, she got a cheap run on the pegs, Matt, and we put her on the pegs early, and um, you know, she got out top of the straight run home well for fourth, so, um, you know, everyone's happy. I thought it was a pretty good effort by Kendra because one, two, three, well, four she was, but she had to come wide uh, around them. I thought her run was um, not a bad effort uh, either, but those three-year-old fillies, it's exciting going towards the mares races, and who knows, will we see one of them at the Inter-Dominion, potentially? I think they'll stick to the mares races because there's such a clump of them over the summer. I wouldn't take them to the Inter Dominion because Inter Dominion's going to be awfully good. What I would say is for a race like the Chariots of Fire next year, our three year old crop, which is becoming four year old tethered by Jesse Duke, isn't very strong. It's just not. Uh, ultimate sniper aside. Yeah, because but I and, think. And even then, his, his body started to betray him. I'm not. That family worries me as a family heading forward because of what their bodies can do. Um, Talking about the other fillies, uh, Jeremy Young, the trainer of Best Westerns, being texting, and he's quite keen to find out if Princess Tiffany's going to go to the Queensland Oaks. I get the feeling if she doesn't go, he might be quite keen to take Best Western. I would take her. No, she's a very tough little filly. She looks like she probably handled the season better than most, and I think she's a horse who would love Australian racing. So I would like to see her go, because what I thought would be 12 to 15 New Zealand horses heading to those races, not just Queensland, but more importantly, the Breeders' Crown. Greg, we might have the lowest representation ever. We might, I'm looking at the numbers on my spreadsheet last night. I'm thinking there could be six to eight New Zealand horses tops hmm. going to Australia over the winter. Wow. Let's talk about the favourite for the New Zealand Cup and for the Inter Dominion. He was favourite for this, dollar fifteen, shortest of the day. His name is Turn It Up. This was the IRT four-year-old Emerald. In many ways, Michael, race over once the barrier draw came out. Uh, Craig Thompson highlighted his speed. He showed that in the Cambridge Mile uh, when he drew one and led there. He led here for fun. Henry Hubert ended up getting a beautiful run. And once again, one, two, three, the fence. What I loved about Jules Day was, yes, the All-Stars won five races, but there were a whole lot of other stories. We've already touched on the Tony Hula factor. And also, the number of horses that placed at long odds. L Nandolo was one of those. He got the Perfect run in this scenario, ended up paying $10 for a place and for the Smiths it was an enormous occasion for them and they've now got a Group 1 place getter. When you go into a race with a horse like that, and, and I did the same thing with Kratos who was long in the market too, a third's a win because you're not expecting to win and you're almost certainly not going to win. So you run third, you're thrilled, because the stake money between third and fourth, trust me, I know, because we missed it by a head, is, is significantly <laughs> different. In the trot, it was $7,000. But also, it's a group one placing. Everybody wants a group one placing. Here's the situation for poor old vintage Cheddar, where one of the better horses in Southland is stuck wide, and, and Lauren Tritton's got every right to drive that way, because she often drives that way. So that's her, her usual modus operandi. But when you're watching this, you're happy on the leader, and you're almost certain you've got the Quinella if you're on the horse in the trail. After that it's who is getting into the finish and who gets the shortcut home. Nandolo was that horse, Vintage Cheddar will keep like a lot of horses um, 
been trapped three wide for the day was the end of him. Here's Ashley Lokas having to come four wide to get around Vintage Cheddar and he just didn't really have any luck at all, did he? He's a far better horse on the marker pegs, Ashley Lokas. He's got that really quick 200 metres, but when you're out there working into that wind, it's, you don't get to use that weapon. So any horse wide on the track here, totally willing to forgive. Turn it up, might be the best four-year-old in the country. He might not be. I guess we'll find out next season when they turn five, whether he or spank him is the best, but on this occasion, he was too good in the four-year-old Emerald. Lokas is next. Turn it up, favourite leads, 150 to go. A length on Henry Hubert, then Ashley Lokas and Nandolo. Turn it up as a neck in front, just holding Henry Hubert for the moment, turn it up, favourites home here, turn it up, beat Henry Hubert third Nandolo, fourth triple eight I think just in front of Ashley Lowe. Yeah so a dominant performance and saying that was the fastest time of the day, 222.6 which at that stage the track had dried out a wee bit because it was quite a strong southerly wind down the back and we hadn't had any rain for a couple of races, maybe even three races so he got the best of the track, if you like, mm. but he was the fastest and sprinted home in 27.5 on the markers. So, well, yeah. so he should have. He's the best horse there for the entire day and maybe he's the best horse in the country. Um, out of the beaten, look, the second horse is a genuine open class horse. We already knew that. And Triple Eight, who ran fourth and came from back in the field, he's an open class horse too. I've got absolutely no doubts he'll end up an open class. So there's a lot from this four-year-old crop, Greg, heading forward who are going to be horses who, who can go on it and be factors in cup races. Nine group one races on the day. Seven won by the yellow harness jewels colours. And all of them won by horses in the first fourth lap to go. Yeah, exactly. So then that's not just because of the track. It makes it a little bit more difficult, but on the whole... At harness racing meetings in this country, traditionally, at premier years, that's what happens. The best horses get to the front of the field with less than a lap to go, and they stay there. Yeah, big thrill, of course, for Lee Pilcher. He was the one to make the speech, uh, and he worked hard on that speech as well, so um, well done to him. I'll love to catch up to him at some stage and hear what he had to say, but uh, uh, once again, the connections involved, Jim and Ann Gibbs. I think I told you on the day that uh, that was their 80th win with Mark Purden, so... The a great rise run. of them as owners has well, been... So I think for someone who's been in gallops as long as Jimmy has for 50 years, I think the change of scenery is really nice because if Jimmy was still knocking around the galloping tracks, he's not going to learn anything new. He already knew all there was to know. So, look, excellent race. Um, the good thing of the day gets home and now the question is who is the best horse heading towards the New Zealand Cup? Some people would say him. Some people would say Spankham, the fixer, whoever else. The good news is we get to find out together. Here's the beaten drivers. John Henry Herbert talked me through it. Uh, got the good draw from one early and uh, showed enough gate speed to hold up and like I say, he's got beaten by a very good horse. What do you do with him now? Uh, he goes out now, he's had a great season. He's sort of um, been up all, and down to Cargo and he's, he's picked up a lot of good races on the way so he deserves a good break. Brave effort. Very good effort. Um, you know, he had the right draw on a day like today. He'd sit back with pigs and do nothing. And, um, you know, if they'd gone a little bit harder down the back, we might have got a little bit closer, but still a fantastic run from him. David Triple Eight kept off a pretty good season with a good run. Oh, yeah, you know, fall back on the fence. It's pretty hard to catch him up front, but he's got him really strongly and really happy with him. Yeah, in that time, one, two, three, four, the fence, um, you talk about it a lot. Who, who do you think's better, spank him or turn it up? On this season? No, no, who's better? Just full stop. Turn it up. OK. Yeah, I think, that, I think they'll, they'll be better at different things. I think Turn It Up might be a better New Zealand Cup, Auckland Cup horse, and I think Spankham might be a better Inter-Dominion horse. If Turn It Up was in front of Spankham... You give him no chance of You give him no chance of beating him. Yeah. Spankham's in front of Turn It Up. You give him no chance of beating him either. I've seen no evidence mm. to suggest... If he was in the trail, I would think he'd get close. Yeah, I really do. We're going to find out. Yep, we together. certainly are. All of us together. <laughs> the, the last of the, the group ones on the day was, appropriately, the Blue Star Taxis Emerald for the three-year-olds. Lights were on by now, uh, Michael, but almost the most predictable race of the day. John Dunn made it absolutely clear that he was going to lead on Heisenberg. Double Rocket came out and had a decent look, and that meant the lead time here was actually very quick for the day, 26.3, which extrapolates out to about a 23.8 in the old 1950. So they were running early. Three wide with cover was of course Jesse Duke who, as was indicated, would get to park and no one else would be able to get to that position. So formulaically this race uh, panned out exactly the way most thought. It makes you realise how lucky we are in harness racing and for people like us in the harness racing media that people just tell you these things. 
So they'll tell you what they're going to do and then you can tell the punters. It doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes it, it's impossible. And if Double Rocket had crossed Heisenberg, then this race would have changed complexion. But the indications were Heisenberg would lead and that Jesse Duke, once he got outside him, would not be handing up the park. That's exactly what happened. And to try and get that information out of other people in other racing jurisdictions is just impossible. So it's incredibly valuable to your punting resource because, as I said before the race, I gave Grand Chico no chance of winning this race, none, because I couldn't see him being anywhere else but three wide, and that's exactly where he ended up. Well, he ended up four wide, not once but twice. Here he is four wide outside Memphis, Tennessee, and then he gets the Humpty again here. His was, without doubt, the run of the day from any horse back in the field and the only horse of the day that could do what he did and place. I'm still lukewarm on the, on the horse. The no, but on the performance, how could you not be impressed I by agree, that? I agree, but they burned so hard early, it was set up for a swooper. Like they went really, really hard. Which but he's is not why swooping, hot. he's come from yeah, the winning post. Agreed, but be, let's be honest, he's going to be close to an open class horse. The rest of the horses behind them aren't very good. No, it wasn't a deep three no, roll. But also they burned incredibly hard. Heisenberg went off the gate really hard with double rocket, and there's no issue with that. Scott Feller was driving to try and get the lead. So... Grand Chico had his chance to win here. Once you don't get involved early, he runs up to have a chance to win and he's beaten by a better horse. Well, Blair had told us before that he wasn't convinced about his last 20 to 50 metres, even when he won the sophomore, and it panned out exactly here. A stronger horse at the finish, Jesse Duke, has been able to kick back and hold him comfortably in the end. At the 150, if you're on Grand Chico, there was a wee hope, but that soon dissipated. Look, the winner was really good. He sat parked after being wide into a hot speed and was still running and in, running into the wind. So I'm not slagging Grand Chico at all, but it's just so easy when you look at, at race times to go, the last 800 was this. Anybody who's done any athletics in their life knows if you burn early and get that lactic acid build up in your legs, it's a lot harder to run. If you do nothing, a lot of horses are making ground in the later stages because they do nothing. He was fantastic, Grand Chico, and he's probably going to be an open class horse, but you run that race a hundred times, Jesse Duke beats him 98 because Jesse Duke's a better horse. He still sat parked for a Group 1 race no, well, and beat him. Well, I don't mind disagreeing with you there. I thought their runs were comparable. I, re I really do because Jesse Duke was three wide with cover until he got to parked. The key to the race for mine was Mark Purden pressing the go button when he did because Grand Chico didn't have a horse to aim up on. He had he got exposed early. Now, does that mean that he's probably not as genuine? Maybe next year he might harden up a little bit more, but I thought the brilliance of Mark Purden there was a, 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 to the fore. It was a great example of him knowing his horse and knowing what he had to do. Well, he had the only Group 1 winner of the race. That's and there right. he's won three Group run, 1 races and he drove him up the best horse. I thought the, the key to the race was the start. When those two horses had to go off the gate for 200 metres, that softened them up and they both didn't make the top three and gave other horses a chance back in the field. But Jesse Duke was still working at that time of the race. So look, it doesn't really matter now. The bottom line is Jesse Duke won and favourite punters got their money. I think he's under offer or he may have even been Jesse sold. Duke. Jesse Duke. So that would mean that Ali Mack and Jesse Duke both sold out of the day, two wins on the day for Gene Feast. Let's see what the beaten drivers had to say and see what Blair made of Grand Chica. Blair, wide draw, what did you make of his run? Yeah, look, we got back early, Matt, and you know, we had to um, make our own move, sort of a lap out, and speed wasn't that strong, but, um, you know, about 100 out, I thought I had Mark beat, but, um, you know, probably just doing that work from last, sit three, three wide, the last lap took its toll, but, you know, he's gone great, so um, next season should be a good season for him. Gee, you come in with a, a rough chance, but a top four finish is pretty good. Yeah, we're pretty wrapped with that, you know, we weren't expecting too much, but he's gone super. Kept off a pretty good season? Yeah, no, there's a good run by that fella, you know, he sort of battled his way into getting to the jewels and he's got a bit of money out of it, so that was great. So that was the last race of the day. Uh, our intrepid reporter, we'll call him, Cameron J. Shaw, has had a count up of Mark Purden's Group 1 winning yes. drives domestically, 127. Yep. So, it's, so, 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 so it's not it's even a, a race it's a big anymore. Number. Um, Ricky's second <laughs> I, and Tony's third. Yeah, I thought Mark might lead because he's just won so many Group 1s. Well, lead, he lives lead by 50. <laughs> yeah, so Mark, sorry for that, we discounted you. Sorry, Rick, um, you're second, but still a very good second. And it's a hell, a hell of a thing to do to drive 71 Group 1 winners. You think about that, if Mark's had 127 domestic, and I'm not sure that number's true, but I've been told it is in my earpiece. 
How many is he had in Australia? Mm. Mark's been driving Group 1 winners in Australia since Sharp and Telford. Maybe before that. It's a big number. It is. If you get bored over winter because there's no more show, <laughs> you, can you can count up. We're in the home straight in your box seat with Woodlands and they sponsored race number one. Not many people were thinking we'd be underway at 12.15. Well, we weren't. It ended up being about 12.18 because we had a false start. But uh, Michael, as the gate rolled here, the horse in the yellow colours drawn the outside, had all the cards, really. Uh, Natalie decided to press forward as we thought she would. Uh, getting out quickly was Tiger Swift and David Butcher. Um, she appeared to run along a wee bit, got on the, on the steel a wee bit, didn't she? And... Um, you see Ali Mack out wide there, just tucking back in and working her way around to parked. And often, this is the best version of the All-Stars horses. They relax for the first 200, get into the rhythm, and then they go sit parked and just win. We've seen it happen so many times. It's not surprising, but it's incredibly hard to do unless you have a fit, strong horse. Wet track strength and fitness were the two key factors for the day. It wasn't easy to sit parked into that headwind down the back straight. Run this race a hundred times and all the horses performed to some sort of level, she would win a hundred times. She is better than these horses. The disappointment major occasion, spoke to the Frisbees afterwards, they said she underperformed and that was clear to see. Yeah, well Ellie Mack gets to parked here and unfortunately for major occasion out there for the remainder. This is what I was talking about earlier, great stories out of the race. Davinia Beleza flashing home for Andrew Stewart and Blair Orange, a group one placing for her, enhancing what she's worth and of course in the shadows Anna Donnelly qualifying three for the jewels picking up a placing with this mare again out of weight for no one already very valuable uh, bred by the Phillips of course and uh, yeah picking up a third in this yeah thrill for both of them I mean it's a it's a tricky thing particularly for the northerners to go down for these races because by the time you fly them down you don't make any money but she did uh, in the shadow, so well done to Anna and the team and the Phillips is there. Um, the winner has subsequently been sold, so we'll join the Brick and Farms Broodmere Band. I'm not sure if they'll race on, but as she was mine, I'd send her to Australia and get a, a 150 or something like that around Manangle. She's way too good for them. Almost the driver of the day was Blair Orange and running second on Davinia Beleza. And as you said, in the shadows gets her Group 1 placing. Here's the girls for the first time for the day, scooting up the straight Mark Mack and then the beaten drivers. And Davinia Beleza, leader is Ellie Mack. Couple of lengths clear on the outside. Davinia Beleza has gone the race of a life. Ellie Mack's in front. Two lengths on Davinia Beleza. Then in the shadows and Sweet Mary. But Ellie Mack is too good. Beat Davinia Beleza in the shadows. Third, Sweet Mary. Fourth, then. Blair, talk me through the run you got out there. Yeah, we're well, okay early, Matt. And then, you know, we sort of ended up a wee way back again by the time some moves were made. And, you know, I took a risk and, and put her up the fence to um, save some ground. So, you know, she's better driven that way. And lucky for us, we got the splits we needed at the right times. And, you know, to run second to Al Max, um, you know, pretty happy with that. And for Andrew Short and that, you know, it's like a win for us. So, um, couldn't be happier. What'd you make of her efforts, Todd? Oh, it was a, it was a great run, Matt. Um, I got a text from Anna this morning and she's been worried, you know, she had a bloody funny foot all week, so um, to run third it was a great effort. I couldn't had no speed early and um, I could have dropped four back the fence early and I thought, no, no, we'll stay out the running line and then I couldn't keep up down the back straight, they were running a bit. John Dunn got pushed out four wide and I thought, oh no, we'll duck back the inside and follow Blair and got a great run and sort of, you know, everything was getting a bit tired around the last bend, so big effort, big effort for um, Anna and, um, and the horse. Sam, Sweet Mary, what did you make of it? Yeah, very happy, Matt. Um, the false start didn't help her. She got a little bit keen as she can do, so um, you know she punched through early and had to do a little bit of work. But um, you know she got a good trip afterwards and, and stuck on there for fourth. So yeah, right with the run. So that was the four-year-old Diamond. We'll go straight into the two-year-old Diamond now. And sweet on me, she'd only been beaten once, of course, out of the wonderful race, Philly and Mare, and Adore Me, who got her jewel back in 2014. Uh, she was drawn up beautifully here to dictate the race, even though she didn't get the front. Tiffany Rose got that quite easily early uh, and uh, gave the trail, of course, to Spellbound throughout who lifted on her latest performance. Yes, she got the beautiful run, but uh, she sat in the trail here and uh, once parked, sweet on me, uh, with 
her biggest rival, Michael, her race, uh, of course, stable mate, an amazing dream, she had to come wide. Now, I spoke to a few of the dri drivers after about three or four races. At that stage, the southerly wind was at its fiercest. So coming wide down the back straight, and we'll uh, talk to, about Blair Oranges with uh, flying even better when we get to that race, um, it wasn't easy for them, and they didn't really want to move when you were running into that wind. No, I, I agree with that, but the leader and the horse parked are also running into that wind too, and they've done more work. But not wide on the track. But it doesn't matter. The, the wind's no worse wide on the track. Oh, I think it'd be worse if you're three or four wide running into it than if you're one or two wide. But I think if you're going down the back straight, you're going in a straight line. Mm. The bottom line is the winner was Maybe into that bend, you know, yeah, look, more so. It's, it, it was no harder than what the leader did, or the horse parked. I, I just, she had a, a harder trip, but I don't think the wind affected her any worse than it affected the first two. She wasn't good enough. The horse in front won and won convincingly after sitting parked. It's very much like Jesse Duke. Best horse won. I can't argue with this. Spellbound, probably the third best horse in this crop run. Second, an amazing dream, just a wonderful little filly. So, look, I thought the horse who probably underperformed was the horse who was worse affected by the wind, and that was Tiffany Rose because she punched into it twice, Greg. And she probably might have raced a length below the best, but maybe the wind was the factor there. I don't know. But no doubt it's the best horse in this crop, sweet on me. Now, she's got a slight bone chip in her knee. She's heading to Madame Madame Vet Clinic for an operation. So she's going to get the bone chip taken out. It wasn't anything serious, but her season's clearly over. So she heads to the paddock already a very, very valuable horse. Well, she's nearly one quarter of a million as well. And, and, and what she worth, you know, and, and what a wonderful advertisement for Sweet Lou. Here's Spellbound going to the passing lane. Amazing dream, just had no luck. Things didn't go her way, but this is a total no-argument job from Sweet on me. Here's Mark Mack, and then the beaten drivers. Spellbound, an amazing dream. Sweet on me, she's just going to be too good for them. Sweet on me beats Spellbound. Amazing dream, Tiffany Rose. Bit of difference to last week. Yeah, it sure was, Matt, and uh, good day to do it. I know um, it's great effort for a two year old filly to bounce back after being so down the dumps a fortnight ago. Yeah, so she's been good this season. Uh, any plans now for her? Uh, she'll go out now. Like, she's sort of grown, and um, there's nothing much left for her, so she'll go out and hopefully make a nice three year old. Natalie, amazing dream. What did you make of her efforts? I thought she was very good. You know, she was wide down the back. Um, I thought her run was excellent. Blair Tiffany Rose uh, been pretty brave again? Yeah, she has, Matt. You know, um, we had our chance in front and, you know, we were allowed to um, run a couple of um, easy quarters there through the middle, but, um, you know, she's probably just come to the end of a long season, but she's stuck in bravely the fourth. So that was the uh, two-year-old girls, uh, the boys, we need to have a look at uh, now to wrap up our look at Harness Jewels 2019. And again, front row draw here, one change, and look at him get off the gate. Yeah, he's not a big horse. He, he's quite a short-coupled horse, and he's just got that natural speed those good juveniles have. And, but they made him work hard here, so it wasn't like he just got to stroll to the front. But... I get a feeling it wouldn't have mattered what had happened to him in the run. He was just better than these on the day. And the second horse was just as clearly better than the rest of them too. So they've sort of worked themselves out. I think if you put flying even better in the front line and able to work to the lead, he would have won too. But this horse, five from five, you can't argue. He's the best two-year-old in the country. I think, Greg, one of the reasons it took many people so long to warm to him was because Smooth Deal had been so good, as we see the race winning move here. Smooth Deal had been so good and his reputation so big that you automatically defaulted to him as the best two-year-old. And it takes a while to forget that bias, but that bias is well and truly gone. Now one change will get every single vote for two-year-old of the year. Another of the special stories was Zeus Bromack, who uh, is in the running line there, just ahead of Dinah Bolt, of course, uh, Zachary Butcher. It's the only horse he's ever trained, is it not? Um, I understand they may have sold uh, part of the horse as well as a result, or not as a result of it running third here, but uh, what a big moment for him, really. Yeah, huge. And he's a horse who may head to the Breeders' Crown, so one of the owners has, has bought Zachary Shear out. Zachary's a young man with a house, and he's trying to make his way in the world, so that makes sense for him. Um, he's potentially a horse who's only had the two starts, so therefore could have hit on to the Breeders' Crown, and, and why wouldn't you? Because these other horses aren't going. So all the purred and good two-year-olds, when I spoke to Mark last night, he said they've had long seasons. So no Virgil, no one change, no flying even better. Flying even better, excellent here. Mid-pack at the moment, eases to the outside. There was a sneaky moment at the top of the straight where you thought he might be a chance of catching the leader, but 
in the end it just didn't happen. So he was too good. One change once again. Held up Virgil flying even better, gets to the extreme outside. Third quarter in 30.7. One change is the leader. Couple of lengths clear. Flying even better. Has gone to a clear second, but it's one change. 100 metres to go. You can trim the nose hairs. You're not going to need them today. One change. Clear of flying even better. Zeus Bromack getting to third, but one change. Wins it by two. Beat flying even better. Zeus Blair flying even better, talk me through that. Yeah, look, we had our charts, Matt, you know, we got out sort of the 400 and, and got trucking, but you know, the last 50 metres I wasn't taking any ground off the winner, so, you know, he's done a great job this season and I'm sure he'll be a lovely three-year-old. There's worse ways to start your training career off. Yeah, exactly right, you know, he um, didn't draw too well and we're a little bit worried going in, but sort of always thought he was a nice enough horse that he, he could be thereabouts at the finish. And, Look, things went our way a little bit in the middle stages and I ended up getting on to Blair's back around the bend, which was always going to help. And, you know, he stuck on really well. He's a horse with a little bit more race and he's going to get harder to it and just a lovely horse to train. And, you know, hopefully we can kick on from here. Is Breeders' Crown an option with him? Oh, definitely. I um, sort of talked to Dad and uh, the Lynette who owns her over in Aussie and she seems really keen to have him over there. And, you know, look, it would be a privilege to take, her, take him over for us. So that's our main goal. And if we can get him there and enjoy that, that that's what training's all about. So it's a good way to start. A lot of things against him, but a top four finish, pretty proud of that. Yeah, absolutely, Matt. No, he's a really nice horse. Uh, come a long way to be here, and he was a rough rough chance, but he's performed uh, above the expectations. Physique-wise, it looks as though he'd be a classy three-year-old. That's the one, Matt. Yeah, he's probably not a natural two-year-old. You've seen that. He threw in a few roughies here at the top of straight, so he's still learning the caper, but... Yeah, he's got, a lot, got plenty of scope about him. So that was the racing side of things for the IRT Harness Jewels. I thought Addington overall did a magnificent job. Obviously John Denton's performance was great, but they had a dinner on the Thursday night where we inducted a couple of legends. Uh, Mark Purden is the uh, human uh, recipient, first ever, and Sky Major because he's the only horse to have won uh, the three jewels. Yeah, it was fun. It was good fun to, for everybody to get together. And uh, the... Australians didn't have a great day on the track, but it was great to have them there. And we did get a question in from, from a viewer, Dallas Patterson, asking, were they paid to be there? No money from Harness Racing New Zealand went toward the Australians coming. They came with their own accord and helped your jewels become more significant to the Australians. No money changed hands. Having them here, whether they win or lose, is a good thing. We had a golf day on the Friday, probably lucky it wasn't the Saturday to be fair, but here's Big Bar having a shot. I reckon that might be the 12th hole at Templeton and Ken Brecken. Pleased he's good at other things than perhaps golf because... Who won the golf day? Uh, it was a group headed up by Steve Ralston, who of course trained Bob's Blue Boy, so that was his team. Um, here's Peter Stoddart, the former pro there. Peter Bacon, who wears all of the gear on race day. That, the colourful uh, individual. He is, yeah, very much so. So, uh, Look at and there's Brian. Is that your pop? That's, that's your, your head pop. having a shot. And, and Brother Mo, he gets yeah, a crack as the, well. Um, look, it's one of the reasons people get into horses. That's Ken Barron. One, one of the reasons people get into horses is to socialise with each other and, and enjoy each other's company. So, there you go. <laughs> look at that. That's uh, Chris Wilson, who, of course, his father trains uh, Robin's Playboy, who finished third and a really good third in the Emerald. And uh, here's some of the scenes. Stevie Golding. Now, yeah. talk, talk me through this. Um, so some money was raised for Pete Davis and Margot Nyan, and that money raised was matched by the racing board. Yeah, that's right. Uh, $1,600 from a raffle that we ran, which was uh, sponsored by a whole lot of people. And uh, we announced that we'd be giving them $1,600. And uh, Gary Woodham from the TAB said, we're going to match that. So okay. 3,200 drops in, along with all the give a little uh, givers over the time. So, um, yeah, a great couple of events. And we go to Cambridge next year for a Friday, Saturday, a bit of a manicado into the Cox Plate sort of feel to it, which is going to be great. So, um, yeah, there's more talk needs to be had around the jewels. Could we move the dates? Yeah, possibly, but we'll save that for another day. It was a great week. Uh, well done to Maddie Williamson. Drove superbly in the World Drivers' Champs. He finished sixth. But, God, he didn't get much in the way of cattle, to be completely honest. Well done to you, Matt. Um, you've done your country and your family proud. Thanks for watching the box seat. Uh, from my point of view, Greg, over your Wednesday night throughout the summer, it's been great to take you through the harness racing season. Greg, it's been a lot of fun, buddy. It certainly has. Really appreciate your input. This time next week, you'll be able to review all of the jewels with the aftermath interviews as well. A big thank you to Woodlands, who've got behind the box seat once again, and to Glenn Bourne, who's done a marvellous job producing the show each and every week. That has been your 2018-19 uh, programme. The box seat.